Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. We're hosting the show today. This is uh, America finding its way to complete deterioration. Um, and we are in the process of deteriorating. It seems clear. Now, you can disagree, um, but we had the Roe v. Wade non-decision yesterday. That was really a, a, a giant step on the way to deterioration here in America. Uh, for the show, we have Tim Apicella. Hi, Tim. Good morning. And we have a special guest, Eureka Jane Sugimura. Hi, Hi Jane. Jay. Hi, Jay How, and Tim. Good morning. Good morning. Jane, Jane is a lawyer. Uh, she's a Democrat, and uh, she has strong feelings, as many people do, about Roe v. Wade. So I styled uh, the show America Finding Its Way um, you know, after Afghanistan because uh, it's back to business, you know, and what do we got business when we come back from Afghanistan? And these are the issues that pop up almost immediately after the evacuation is done. So, Tim, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade, the non-decision, the silent decision. By the way, Jane, we read it on the show yesterday. We, we, we read it on Tim's show. It only took a moment because there was nothing to read. <laughs> Not a thing. So, you know, Tim, what does this mean? I'm going to ask Jane the same question. What does that silent decision mean in terms of, um, you know, the, the right of a woman to choose in this country? Uh, the vision of other countries, the, you know, the way other countries see us now, um, the way people see the Supreme Court, the way people see, you know, Texas and other states that are likely to follow in its, uh, in its very muddy footsteps. <clears throat> uh, what are we going to have now after this silent decision? It's a, this is a tangled question that you ask, because number one is, is this a silent decision to say that the, the majority of these, the Supreme Court intends to reverse the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision? Or is it just their way of saying, we, we weren't presented a brief, we weren't presented arguments for or against this decision in Texas. Therefore, we have nothing, we have no standing in which to ask to answer it. And I don't know if it's just um, a smug way of uh, ignoring a very, very serious uh, uh, law in Texas. Or was it their silent way of saying, down the road, we plan to overturn Roe v. Wade? Well, some people have said this is going to lead to a, a, not only the strange mechanisms of this uh, Texas law, now the law, um, you know, where people report on others and sue others for a stated penalty, a liquidated penalty of $10,000, and they get their attorney's fees. I mean, you can see that's going to motivate people and lawyers. Uh, to initiate lawsuits under this thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, it does raise the, the whole Gestapo thing in Germany. You can, you know, you can do it against uh, your, your uh, estranged uh, spouse, uh, somebody you don't like, um, a, uh, somebody in business, uh, even your parents. It's tell on someone else and make money at it. It's really wonderful. So, and, and you have to assume that other states will pick up on the same thing. Other Republican led states will pick up on the same thing. So what, what does this mean in terms of a, a shift of the, what do you call it, the methodology, the mechanism, um, you know, of, of enforcing state laws? That question for Jane or myself? You. Um, what it means is, uh, you know, right now we're in a kind of a state of chaos. And um, Jane will make a point, I think, here in the, in the future about what people said before they were selected to be on the Supreme Court. I, I think, frankly, um, states will run out as fast as they can. Uh, Mississippi, all the, uh, many of the red states, the southern states, will run out and try to enact something very similar to what Texas is now living with uh, because they weren't, uh, they weren't, they've been given the green light to go ahead with it. Um, it's very troubling. And, and frankly, you know, I may not have the credibility because I'm a male to really opine on this. But the problem is, um, if you're a, a female and, and this law will affect those who are economically disadvantaged that don't have means to travel to another state, um, this is really bad news. And the worst part is this law entails that in cases of incest or rape, that uh, this this six week period will be enforced. This is unheard of. This is, uh, you know, we're back to the dark ages as far as this kind of law is concerned. As far, you know, it's, it's a horrible thing. So interesting in the interim, you know, in the years that it has existed since 73, I guess, 
Uh, the world has found a way to legalize abortion. And now the U.S. turns around and essentially is criminalizing it. Um, so, Jane, you know, doesn't this sound to you like the Supreme Court is, um, is, is legislating? Because in 73, they found um, that it was a constitutional right of a woman to choose. And now they're saying it's not a constitutional right of a woman to choose, or they're allowing a, a, a state law to go through that, that, that provides that. So we have a, you know, we all learned in law school about how courts are not supposed to legislate and that's to be discouraged. Well, here, the Supreme Court is legislating, isn't it? Well, it's, it sure seems like it. And, you know, uh, and as Tim alluded to, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm very disappointed in, uh, you know, the two justices, uh, uh, Justice Comey and, and Kavanaugh, when they were being vetted. Uh, you know, to be on the Supreme Court, they were asked the question about respecting the precedent of Roe v. Wade. And they said, yes, that was the law of the land. That was a, a previous decision by, you know, their predecessors, and they would respect that. And I think the decision that, you know, happened yesterday shows that they're not. They're not respecting precedent. And I think that's wrong. And I think that that was a decision that was on their plate yesterday for the whole Supreme Court. And I, 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 I commend the Chief Justice you know, for, for supporting that, supporting past precedent of the Supreme Court. I mean, that was the law. They, when they were vetted, they said they would respect it, they would honor, they would, and they would not you know, go against it. And, and, and this is what we get. Well, it's a sneaky thing. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's ruling by silence. Uh, we don't, you know, we, I think we know uh, uh, that Chief Justice Roberts voted, you know, uh, against the uh, conservative uh, majority, um, but we, that's, that's like almost rumor, I think. Uh, we don't know what their decision process was. We don't know what their reasoning was, nothing. They didn't write an opinion. They may never write an opinion. If, as Tim suggests, we have other states that will do the same thing, um, we can go through the same kind of process again never writing an opinion. You know, what is, what is interesting is the paradox that we live in. There are people, millions, tens of millions of people that say, it's my body and I have the freedom to reject a vaccine. It's my choice. Okay, these are the same people who say, but you know, you do not have the choice of uh, having a child or not. You don't have reproductive choice. Uh, that's what they call a paradox. How do you feel about that? Well, I I, I agree with you. It, you know, it, it's not right for the you know for those people to say out of one side of their mouth, you know, I, it's my body and I don't need to, you know, I don't have to get the vaccine, and to pass judgment on others, you know, who want to um, have this procedure done. And I was I'm old enough, Jay. I'm old enough to remember when abortions were illegal in most of the United States. And people had to go, and these are rich people, people who had money could go to a foreign country and get an abortion. And then New York made it legal. And then you had people, you know, spending money going to New York and, you know, uh, getting, getting an abortion um, because, uh, you know, uh, they, didn't, they made a mistake. They made a mistake and, you know, they, they wanted to have this procedure done and they didn't want to die because back then too, what we had along with, you know, um, people, or the rich people getting abortions and, and the people who did not have resources couldn't get it. You had women allowing these quacks to do these abortions in back alleys with hangers and women were dying, if not from the procedure, from the aftermath. And so that was another reason why this, um, uh, why, why, you know, the courts, you know, allowed this procedure to happen so that women, you know, who made a mistake uh, could have an abortion and have it done safely. And in a place, you know, where, uh, you know, they wouldn't have to worry about infection or dying. And so- And Hawaii you know, was right there too, you know? Hawaii was one of the first states that permitted abortion right here. People were right. flying from the non-abortion states to Hawaii uh, to have abortions. It was, it was not spoken of, you know, uh, frequently, but it was the law here. 
Um, and, and I and I'm I'm in your generation, um, Shane. And maybe maybe Tim is a little younger. I'm afraid. Um, but but you know, we I remember. All, <laughs> I remember we the issues. All remember the people you know who, um, and, and they were you know couples. They were couples, and they made a mistake. Uh, she got pregnant. And uh, before you know it, uh, their lives were about to be ruined. Uh, their parents would throw them out of the house because of you know the the morality at the time. Uh, schools would throw them out. Um, there they wouldn't be able to get a job. The whole thing would wind up in a tailspin, and they were ruined. So if you give them an option to go down the docks in in Brooklyn and talk to the lady with the coat hanger, they would do that because it was a it's a balancing of the risks. And the risk of having the child was so great that their lives would be ruined. They'd rather take the chance with the lady on the docks. Uh, and when um, New York and Hawaii adopted uh, abortion, the statutes would allow abortions. It was a great burden lifted off our generation, wasn't it? All yes, of a yeah. sudden, we said, this country is progressive. This country understands and is sensitive. And when you reverse it now, pardon me, uh, one more point I want to make, and this is for your reaction, Tim. Isn't anti-abortion legislation like this racist? Because what, what it does is it, it, it punishes the disadvantage. The people in Texas who can't go to another state and get an abortion there, they have to stay in Texas and have the child. And frequently they're black and brown, they have no money, um, and they're stuck. And, and uh, you know, if, if what, the people, you know, in the Texas legislature and, and courts want to do is to punish the black and brown. What a great idea. Do it this way. But if you look forward, there'll be more black and brown involuntary children, won't they? So this is another paradox. If, if, if you want to undermine the black and brown communities, this isn't the way to do it. You just make people angry. And you create a, you know, a further impetus to greater black and brown population because they don't have a choice. What are your thoughts? My reaction is there's so many reactions. This is such an emotional issue, and it has been since 1973, and it's been an emotional issue before 1973, as Jane eloquently described. Um, you use the word paradox. I, th I think that's the wrong word. I'm sorry to edit you <laughs> on your own show, but I think the word is hypocrisy very hypocritical of the GOP to do this. And I fully agree with you that once again, the GOP is so threatened about white power being diminished in the legislatures around the country, in the cities, governments, that it's just one more example how, how power has to be uh, implemented and, and the white power legislation has to take control over um, those cities, those states where there's minority populations. And I couldn't agree with you more about this effort. Um, I also have another uh, reaction that is, again, this, this Texas law in, includes the, uh, the allowance of incest and rape for these pregnancies to continue. Uh, and I've heard the arguments from people that say, well, that's okay, because it's the Christian thing to do. Um, it's, I thought there was a separation between church and state. I didn't think we were a theocracy where these kind of laws allow this horrific uh, forcing a woman this horrific experience of carrying to term uh, either rape or incest, and um, that abortion is not allowed because it's not the Christian thing to do. Uh, where did we get to that point? How did we get to that point? And I'm on a roll. Go ahead, Jay. Next question. Yeah, thank you. Really good points. So, so Jane, you know, can you look into the crystal ball? What is going to happen? The, the, you know, the probability is the Supreme Court is not going to change this. This Texas statute will be the law in Texas and elsewhere, where people can sue their enemies. Who knows what? Their, even their family and friends and get a, an easy $10,000 uh, or, um, you know, at least make the other person miserable because they can't lose this lawsuit. E even if there's no sign there was a violation of the statute, uh, they still have the, 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 uh, the right um, to uh, punish anyone they want to punish, uh, what it amounts to, and get attorney's fees in the process. So what's, what's going to happen with that? How is that going to change um, the life in America, the life in the courts? This, the, um, what do you call it? The rule of law, uh, law as a, an equitable um, moral force in our community. 
Well, you know, I think what the, the Democrats all across the country and anybody else who cares, this is a wake up call. This is a time now to get involved with the government, to elect people who are going to work in their state legislatures to make sure these types of laws aren't passed and maybe to repeal the ones that are so offensive, like the one that got passed in Texas recently. So, you know, that's what I think this is. This is a wake up call. People got to figure, you know, have to make up their minds that they don't want to live in a society where these laws happen and they can stop it. But that means that they got to be part of the process. Otherwise, they are just going to end up being the victims of the laws that do get passed by this, uh, this new majority uh, who, you know, who have this agenda that, you know, that they, you know, uh, want to impose on everybody else. Well, it may, you know, you say that, but it, it may be, it may be hard to do that, given the impediments that have been um, created in a number of states over voting rights and suppression of voting rights, including redistricting and, you know, a dozen other things. And the fact that Congress, now we're back to business, you know, post Afghanistan evacuation, we're back to business. What are the prospects that Congress is gonna pass either of the voting rights bills? And if we don't have these voting right, rights bills, and we have so many states adopting suppression bills, it isn't so easy to go to the polls and change this as you suggest. Is no, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that I think a lot of, a lot of people have kind of just sat back and they've let other people, you know, make their decisions for them. This is a wake up call. This is so, 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 you know, the Democratic Party and others have to work really hard to educate these people and get them to vote. If they don't want to live under this type of regime or under these laws, it's up to them to stand up, take action and, and do whatever they can to vote, to elect people who are going to pass laws that are going to make it, um, uh, uh, you know, make access to, you know, voting uh, more open. More. I, I want that. I know you want that, and Tim wants that. But Tim, you know, <clears throat> um, the Democratic Party is not completely together these days, and I, I think that was uh, we we saw that in connection with the response and criticism uh, that was showered on Joe Biden uh, in connection with the evacuation. And, and as Jane points out, you know, we need to have the Democratic Party together. Uh, we need to have every man, woman and child uh, support these voting rights uh, bills in Congress. Um, but, you know, up till now, essential, I mean, Im Im implicit in that is that they haven't done the job that we would like them to do just yet. So what are your thoughts about the Democratic Party? How do we re uh, revitalize it? Uh, do we need to revitalize it? What can be done? I think Jane just gave the exact answer that this decision in Texas that's allowed to remain and other states will quickly act to it. There'll be other states in no time flat about the same kind of law that will solidify the Democratic Party under a wedge issue. And nothing like this will solidify the Democrats more than this one. You remember in the early 70s, all through the 80s, um, that was a key point to Democrats being as one, um, these kind of wedge issues. And I think Jane is, is well, what they have done will, will, will turn out voters like never seen before, despite the restrictions and the new, the new voting, voting law restrictions, you will see a, an increased turnout like never been seen before. And that may help very much 2022 and the retainment of the House for Democrats and potentially for the Senate. Yeah, I'm not that all optimistic, uh, uh, all that optimistic about 2022 or 2024. <laughs> and for the moment, I think of other things. I mean, for example, uh, why doesn't Joe Biden or someone else in the Democratic Party initiate um, a, a bill right now to codify Roe v. Wade? Uh, and if that takes, uh, you know, the repeal or amendment of the filibuster, um, let's do it. Um, and, um, you know, I think we only have a certain amount of time um, before we have another, we have the opportunity um, to fill another seat, a seat uh, just, just as Breyer has. Um, but, you know, I think the Democratic Party has got to get that going, don't you think? And, and how about a bill that would add additional seats in the court? 
because you know these guys are there for life and that means that for a long time the trump court will prevail with these right-wing and immoral decisions so many of them um don't you think we should uh, initiate a bill to add seats and essentially pack the court not only with obama but others I think that the um, the idea was a kind of lukewarm idea uh, for Biden to add additional Supreme Court justices uh, to the bench. I think I think this issue uh, reinvigorates that concept, and there will be a lot more support for Joe Biden and pressure for him to potentially add more more seats. Yeah, same question to you, Jane. We're we're evacuated now from Afghanistan. Here we are back back to business, what can we do uh, to be sure that we, we don't wind up in the soup here uh, in Congress politically? Well, no, I, I, I agree with what Tim says. I think that, you know, this, this, the, the decision that happened, you know, yesterday is, is uh, supports the fact that, you know, uh, you know, legislation can be introduced to increase the number of people who sit on the courts. I think, I think that there are, you know, there are gonna be a lot more people we're going to be disappointed with what the Supreme Court did, and uh, would, would you know would be in support of that type of initiative. Okay, when I say when I say back to business again, I mean business very loosely, because uh, uh, I don't have to tell you we had a great threat to the to the country on January sixth, but there are people now, uh, white supremacist groups and others, uh, surprisingly many others. Who would like to have another <clears throat> another party in Washington on September 18th? That's only 10 days away. Is it 10 days away? Less than 10 days away. And um, I think it's really important that we, you know, uh, remain aware of that because we could have the same thing again, the same people. And you have actual congressmen and women taking the position that they're heroes. And the villains are the ones who shot that woman in the insurrection. Uh, the villains are those who would prosecute uh, these 500 defendants and the 500 defendants are the true patriots. This is all gonna be revisited in, on national TV, I'm telling you, uh, on September 8, 18th. So uh, Jane, you first on that. Um, how concerned are you about it? And what do you think can be done about it? And in any event, what's gonna happen? Well, first of all, you know, I think, you know, it, it's very disconcerting that, you know, the, that uh, people are thinking that there's going to be another insurrection or another event of that type and that they would support uh, such an event. I mean, it's very disconcerting because, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's disconcerting that you have people in Congress calling them heroes and, and, and supporting their position because I think the majority of the people in this country were horrified when they saw what was going on on January 6th. And, and you know, they figured, how could this happen in the United States? And, you know, I think that's, that was what um, was uh, the view of, from uh, foreign countries who were watching the news that day. And, and, and the fact that we have people in our own Congress who support some of those people I mean, that's also disconcerting. It's a big divide. I don't know how you, you, you get the country together, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, that's a problem. Well, you know, Tim, I mean, it's incredible that um, McCarthy um, in the House uh, is going to punish anybody who cooperates, punish quote, anybody who cooperates with the select committee investigation there. Uh, the GOP doesn't want an investigation. Uh, they they want to control the narrative on what happened on January 6th, and, and they want to be able to tell us it was just a bunch of tourists having fun on a given day of the week. And, um, and you know, I, I'm really troubled with that because I think that only foretells um, more obstacles, um, more distractions from that committee. It won't be easy for them to get the documents they want. It won't be easy for them to get the witnesses they want. And it only shows me that a number of GOP Congress people were involved, knew about it in advance, supported it. Um, so um, you know, query, where are we on that? I mean, this all bespeaks, but not only of a, a further insurrection on 
September 18th, but a complete stonewall on trying to find out what happened. Again, I take issue with some of the language you use. You said we're involved, they're still involved. Um, let me read a quick quote from um, Representative Madison Cothorn, 26 years old, a freshman uh, congressman, and he said the following in uh, Macon County. The things that we are wanting to fight for, it doesn't matter if our votes don't count. Because you know, if our election systems continue to be rigged and continue to be stolen, then it's going to lead to one place and it's bloodshed. He further said, I would tell you as much as I am willing to defend our liberty at all costs, there is nothing that I could dread more than having to pick up arms against my fellow American. Uh, if that's not a call for insurrection and bloodshed by a congressman, a federal congressman, I don't know what is. And Nancy Pelosi should immediately place him on, uh, sanction him somehow, some way for this kind of, for this kind of rhetoric. And, uh, you know, it's like a fire. It's catching fire. And September 18th is catching on. Ooh, change September 18th. Um, is long before election day. And, um, you know, your suggestion is that Democratic Party go out there and vote hard um, may not be soon enough. What's your answer to that? I don't know. I, I think, you know, we need to, you know, step up the rhetoric as well uh, and start fighting, you know, for, um, for what this country stands for. And for, I think, the majority of the people in this country who believe in law and order and, and, and respect uh, you know, of others. And, uh, and I think we're not saying, thing, saying those things loud enough, because it seems like all we are hearing is the re Republican rhetoric, which is defending what happened on January 6th, which is probably the, what's leading to what may happen on September 18th. You know, when I fashioned the title of the show, you know, um, you know, you know, back to business, uh, I was thinking of, um, hey, um, what is Congress going to do about COVID? What's Congress going to do about the filibuster, about infrastructure, which seems to be you know, put on the back burner during the uh, evacuation? Uh, what's Congress going to do about voting rights? It, you know, it's, um, it's, it seems like all of that is in jeopardy. Uh, immigration reform, um, lots of luck. Uh, gun control, forget about it. Um, you know, this is, uh, that's back to business where you expect Congress is gonna tackle these things. And so what we've talked about today is very distracting. It's distracting in terms of the rule of law, the function, the effect of the Supreme Court, the morality of the Supreme Court. Our institutions are in jeopardy. Our legislative agenda, Joe Biden, his legislative agenda is in jeopardy. And so my question is, uh, are we, Tim, are we gonna get back to business or we like like COVID going to be in a like a forever distraction mode and never get back to business. We will get back to business and, and remember Congress is on out, you know out of session. And it's true, we haven't seen any action on infrastructure or voting rights because it hasn't been in the news. Uh, there's there's been no active debate in Congress. So when they get back from Congress, I am confident minimally that they're gonna take up the smaller infrastructure package, the 950 billion or one, $1 trillion package. I think that sails through. I also think they take up the John R. Lewis uh, voting right bill. I think they take that on because it's, it's paramount that they do so. And I agree with Jane, it's time for the Democrats to start stepping up their rhetoric. And Jay, you've heard me say this here on the show multiple times. It's time for the Democrats to stop taking a soup ladle to a knife fight. And they've got to get going and they've got to stand on their own two hind legs and fight for that which they think is important. And it's the John R. Lewis bill for one and two, the infrastructure, this country's falling apart. And uh, then they're gonna have to stand up and look at how this Texas decision on abortion is going to affect them. There's so many things, but they can do it. They're gonna have to do it one thing at a time, one foot in front of the other at a time, but it will get done, I believe. And I think we're making forward progression. Jane, are you as optimistic as Tim? I think, you know, I, 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 I have to think that, you know, our uh, representatives in Congress are going to be working on the things that uh, Tim mentioned, the infrastructure bill, the John Lewis bill, 
and uh, and and others. I mean, that's what they're there for. And you know, the fact that they, you know, we haven't heard a lot uh, about what's happening in Congress could be because you know they are in recess right now. And so when they come back, hopefully that's what they will do, and they will step up the rhetoric and uh, address the concerns. You know, like what happened in the Supreme Court uh, the other day. And you know, and and uh, you know what's happening in this country, and you know they, they need to take 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 back the country, uh, you know from 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 the Republican rhetoric, you know that is supporting uh, the, the insurrection that occurred on January sixth. Well, for years, Tim and I have been talking about inflection points, and trying to prognosticate on you know where it goes from here, and actually over the uh, Trump administration. All our worst, <laughs> our worst expectations were realized one by one, and so I guess I would say, here's another inflection point. Let us see what happens. We are out of Afghanistan. There are only residual issues left. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to minimize the problems of the Americans that are there and the uh, Afghans want to get out, but there are only, relatively speaking, minimal problems left. And now it's up to the administration to step up the rhetoric. To make some of the, these ideas happen, uh, to go get Joe Manchin out of the mm, catbird seat the way he's been, and to uh, move forward. And it's another inflection point. Are we going to have that, or are we going to have a forever distraction? Uh, and it's not clear. And in this show, we'll discuss that. We'll connect those dots. We will not forget where we are here today. But let me get back um, from the 50,000 foot level to a question because I feel that everybody who asks a question here on this show ought to have an answer. And this goes back to the question of abortion. It's a very interesting question. And it came from a viewer. Thank you to all the viewers who send in questions. Okay, here's the question. Jane, you're gonna be first. What about those men who rape and that rape results in pregnancy? Are they still required to pay child support? as they would have been in the past. Jane? That's an interesting question. I would think that if the, you know, if uh, the abortion law says that they, they I mean, the, the Texas law says that they can't have abortions, I would, uh, you know, have to say that, yes, they would be responsible for child support in that situation. They should be. Yeah, and maybe it's a joinder. So this guy starts a $10,000 lawsuit against, uh, say, a woman who had an abortion, uh, and she uh, brings in the third party, the person who raped her, assuming she can find him, uh, and she sues him um, for the child support in the same proceeding. I don't think, you know, this bill was not well thought out. I don't think there's any right. reason why she couldn't do that. And so right. you have a bit of a complexity, don't you? Yes. Tim, what are your thoughts about this? Is this a, a regular family court matter? Oh, to answer just your question, no, it's not a family court matter. It's a criminal matter. Last time I checked, rape was a criminal offense. And so, yeah, he's going to pay us 75 cents an hour uh, and give half of that up for child support uh, as he's stamping out license plates. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for your answers to that question. And thank you to the viewer who, who posed that question. Let's, uh, let's close up now. Uh, Jane, um, what are your final thoughts you want to share with the audience? Uh, well, uh, hopefully, you know, like I said, I hope this was, you know, I hope this will be a wake up call uh, to people out there uh, to, you know, start standing up for, you know, their rights and uh, insisting that uh, their elected officials, uh, you know, act in a way uh, to uh, promote, you know, civil liberties and individual freedoms rather than limit them the way you know, uh, the Texas law and the Supreme Court, recent Supreme Court decision. Okay, yeah. There is no option for complacency. Tim, your thoughts? You know, you had mentioned um, discussions we've had for years about, you know, where we're at, where we've been with the Trump administration, the breakdown of institutions, the breakdown of democracy, the challenge to the rule of law. And I said years ago, I said, the wheels of democracy will remain they'll hold. And although we got close to it, very close in the last year, year or two, and certainly on uh, January the 6th, I still believe the wheels of democracy will, will stay on and we'll get through these troubling times, but uh, and we'll come out stronger for it, I think. Uh, we'll vulcanize over it, 
And um, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that that will be the case. Okay, we can take a further look at your opinion right after September 18th uh, and see how you feel then. Tim Apicella, uh, Jane Sugimura, thank you so much, the two of you, for participating in our discussion. Aloha. Thank you.